so now let's get into um, equations. Uh, you know, revolving around solubility. And we're going to break it up into kind of three uh, types of phases. And so the first would be looking at gas phase solutes. And so for gas phase solutes, what we find is, is that there is a direct relationship between um, the pressure of a gas um, and its solubility. And that relationship is simply the greater the pressure of the gas, the greater its solubility. And this is known as Henry's Law. So that's the relationship we have. The greater the pressure of the gas, the greater its solubility. And Henry's Law uh, looks like this, where we have S of a gas, which is going to stand for solubility of a gas, is equal to um, Henry's constant times the pressure of a gas. So here we have uh, our solubility of the gas. That would be in terms of molarity. We have here Henry's constant, which is a solvent specific and has the units of moles per liter um, atmospheres. So there's Henry's constant. And then we have um, the pressure of our gas. So that's Henry's law. And something that we have to understand about, you know, Henry's law is that we have to be, you know, specific with the gas um, and its pressure. Um, meaning that, you know, sometimes we have mixtures of gases, and so that's where we'd have to be um, careful. So it's a specific for the gas and its pressure, so we need to be careful um, with uh, mixtures of gases, and so we might want to have to recall some old old materials such as from uh, you know module 10 which is looking at um, Dalton's law of partial pressures mainly you know that 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 equation that allows us to relate the pressure of a gas to the total pressure. And there's our old mole fraction idea. So here we have the partial pressure of our gas. 
Uh, here we have, you know, the total pressure. And then here would be our mole fraction, which would be moles of gas over total moles of gas. So sometimes you have to use both of these equations um, depending on, on what you're actually given. And this idea of Henry's Law is something that we've, you know, observed um, in, let's say, you know, opening up a bottle of, let's say, Coca-Cola. And, you know, the idea is that, you know, you know, we should just think about observations, you know, you know, what, what do you observe when you open up a bottle of soda? Um, two things that I observe is the right um you know the the escape of of gas is what we're hearing there right by that sound we're actually see, or hearing the escape of carbon dioxide gas but the second observation is is that we see bubbles emerge in the soda and so that is what we would call degassing. Right, we've talked about that already with our temperature effects. And so now we're actually seeing it here with a, a pressure effect. So in terms of, you know, the, the, the Coca-Cola bottle, right, that we have... Let the forgive the drawing. Um, we have our bottle of soda, and we have this cat, and we are under pressure. So if we say that this is the soda, we then above the soda have gas. The gas that we have is carbon dioxide. So we have carbon dioxide within that headspace, and we're probably about, you know, four atmospheres of pressure within that. Now if we take our crude res you know representation of our you know bottle and now we'll have it you know open where now we uncapped it essentially get this a little bit better right it's open what's happening right is all well, that gas is 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 escaping right and that's the sound and so that's what you know one of the things that happens when we open the soda bottle The other thing that we start to see is also gas bubbles now evolving, coming up and out of solution. So what's happening here is we have, you know, the which is 
indicating a drop in pressure, right? And that's drop in pressure is because since the carbon dioxide gas is escaping. So there is a drop in CO2 pressure. What happens because of that CO2 pressure drop, that means that we have now less solubility of CO2. Since, right, there is now less pressure. And that's the idea of Henry's law, is just that idea that, you know, an increased solubility comes from uh, increase in pressure of the gas. And we're specifically talking about gas solutes. So if our pressure drops, um, we should see less solubility. And that's very apparent in, in the soda bottle experiment, um, like we can see uh, here. Now let's do uh, an example of Henry's Law. And so the solubility of nitrogen gas at 25 degrees Celsius and 748 millimeters of mercury is 6.693 times 10 to the negative fourth molar. And what we're asked is what is the concentration or what is the solubility of nitrogen gas when dissolved in water at 25 degrees Celsius under atmospheric conditions remember atmospheric conditions would be one atmosphere or 760 millimeters of mercury. So under atmospheric conditions, um, if uh, air contains 78% by volume nitrogen gas. So there's our question. So Immediately what I start to see is, you know, we're talking about the solubility of nitrogen gas. You know, we're asked to calculate the solubility of nitrogen gas under a, a slightly different set of conditions. And so both of those are pointing us to the fact that we're talking about a gas solute. And that's automatically looking at Henry's Law where the solubility of our nitrogen gas would be equal to KH times the pressure of our nitrogen gas. So, so that's Henry's law, and that's what we need to utilize for this particular question. Um, and so we're going to use utilize information a little bit differently. Like here above, we have a solubility and we have a pressure of our nitrogen gas. So here's our pressure of nitrogen. We also have here a solubility 
of nitrogen, and, and this would be like conditions one. Because the one thing that we're missing, oftentimes we can look it up, but in this example it's missing, we need to solve for what KH is equal to, to solve for it as a constant. We then have really what the question is asking us, which is, okay, what is the solubility of nitrogen um, under atmospheric conditions where air contains 78% by volume nitrogen gas? So here, this is a partial pressure idea, and that's going to allow us then to get to what we're looking for, which is what is the solubility of that nitrogen gas under atmospheric conditions. So for the second, we're really using the same experiment, or rather equation. Um, but first we would need to figure out what is the pressure of the nitrogen gas equal to before we could go to part B of step two, which is to solve the actual question as far as my solubility of nitrogen gas. So we start with step one, right? We can just plug in the values, but we do have to be careful with our, our pressure Right, our pressure needs to be in atmospheres. So we need to do a conversion there um, first. So that pressure of nitrogen gas would be equal to, you know, our 748 millimeters of mercury. We would have to divide that by 760 millimeters of mercury to get that into um, atmospheres. And so we should have 0 0.9842 atmospheres of our nitrogen gas in the first set of conditions. So now that we know that we can plug in our values. We have our solubility given to us as 6.693 times 10 to the negative fourth molar. That's equal to KH times the pressure of our nitrogen gas, which is 0 0.9842 atmospheres. And so we can solve for the KH of this process to be 6.8 times 10 to the negative fourth uh, moles per liter atmosphere, you know, or we could say molar per atmosphere, right? They're the same, they're the same units. So that's step one. With step two, namely A, we have to figure out now the pressure of nitrogen gas in the air mixture. Because now we're talking about not pure nitrogen gas, we're talking about something that's, you know, 78% by volume. So somehow we have to use that value of 78% to, to help us out. And one thing that we have to remember, and this is going back to, you know, module 10 and, and gas laws. And, and that is, is basically that volume of a gas and moles of a gas are directly related to one another.
you might remember Avogadro's Law. which states that V1 over N1 equals V2 over N2, right? There's that direct relationship between volume and moles. The more moles I have of a gas, the greater the volume that gas occupies so long as I'm at constant temperature and constant pressure for that simple relationship to work. So what does that mean? That means that 78% by volume of nitrogen gas is the same as saying 78% by mole of nitrogen gas or my mole fraction of nitrogen gas is equal to 0. 7, 8. So that's um, the logic that, that we have here with this percent pi volume is that's actually allowing us to get at a mole fraction which now allows us to figure out our partial pressure of the nitrogen gas which would be the 0 0.78 times one atmosphere. So our pressure of the nitrogen gas is equal to 0 .0 0 0.78 atmospheres. So that's part A with step number two. And then that takes us to the part B of that, which is now to actually solve for our nitrogen solubility given the fact that now we're under atmospheric conditions and we're not under pure nitrogen gas conditions. So we um, have our KH, we got that up of in part A, or I'm sorry, in step one that was a 6.8 times 10 to the negative fourth moles per liter atmosphere. We have now our pressure of 0 0.78 atmospheres. And so we can finally solve the question um, with the solubility of our nitrogen gas equaling a value of 5.3 times 10 to the negative fourth molar. Notice that we observe less solubility because the pressure, you know, that pressure of nitrogen is dropping. In the step one, we had our pressure of nitrogen gas equal to 0 0.9842 atmospheres. And in our second step, we had our pressure of nitrogen gas equal to 0 0.78 atmospheres. And so, <clears throat> This results in a solubility for <clears throat> the, the 0.9842 atmospheres to be 6.693 times 10 to the negative fourth molar, while for the 0.78 atmospheres, it's 5.3 times 10 to the negative fourth molar. So notice, again, we see greater solubility because of the notion of greater pressure as a result. And so that's why we observe the different, you know, concentrations of solution that we can actually obtain for this gas. So that is Henry's law. I'm looking specifically at 
gas solutes um, dissolving in liquid solvents. Uh, generally, our liquid solvent is water, but there, but there are other solvents that we could use in this type of example. So now we get to the second piece, which would be now looking at liquid uh, solutes. And with liquid solutes, um, the vapor pressure of the solution is equal to the vapor pressures of the liquids, meaning both um, our solute and our solvent are liquid, so they're both going to have vapor pressure. So it's equal to the vapor uh, pressure of the liquids uh, with a dependence on mole fraction or the more of a liquid that is present the more it contributes contributes to the overall to the overall vapor pressure. So it's it's really a, a summation, but it's a it's a weighted um, sum. And this is known as Rote's law. where we have the pressure total or of the solution in terms of vapor pressure is equal to the mole fraction of liquid A times the pure vapor pressure of liquid A plus the mole fraction of liquid B times the pure vapor pressure of liquid B. So here we have our total vapor pressure of solution uh, here we have the contribution of liquid A to um, the solution's vapor pressure. And then we see something similar there with liquid B in that this is its con contribution. So that's Rhodes Law. It's, it's not too terrible. Uh, and so all it's kind of looking at is um, you know a plot that we could we could draw that would represent this where we just have an interesting double kind of y-axis plot and let's say that we were talking about a mixture of carbon tetrachloride and um, toluene both are, are liquids and we could say that you know here we're starting at zero mole fraction 
of the carbon tetrachloride, and then we're at um, one uh, in terms of the mole fraction, or we have zero on the other side to represent you know, no toluene, and then as we go the other direction, increasing its particular mole fraction. So what you end up with is a, a plot that would look like possibly like this. Where the red line here is toluene. So if we look at this dot right there, that would be the pure vapor pressure of the toluene. If we look at the carbon tetrachloride, get something that looks like this. It's like I gotta extend my axes just a little bit there. And so we have, you know, another axis. So we would have looking at uh, carbon tetrachloride. And then that dot is going to be the pure vapor pressure of carbon tetrachloride. And we can then draw a line to connect the two. And so that's kind of then representing the total vapor pressure of solution. Which is just a combination. So let's say that we were um, at this data point somewhere where we have a little bit more carbon tetrachloride compared to toluene, right? If we look at the different values here, right, where it, it crosses, or right here would be one contribution, and that would be the carbon tetrachloride contribution. And then if we go, you know, further up, now showing, you know, we're going to be up at this particular data point for the toluene, that its contribution would be something like that. So those are the individual contributions that we have, and that all then points to once we add them up to this data point at the very, very top. And so that would be the vapor pressure of the solution given these two combinations of quantities of toluene and carbon tetrachloride. So I know it's kind of a rough graph because there's you know a bunch of lines and I try to represent that with color. But the idea is that you know it's a weighted sum that you know each of the solvent or each of the liquids here toluene carbon tetrachloride are both liquids they both have a vapor pressure right and so their individual contribution to the total is really just dependent on how much of that particular liquid you have so in this case if we look at it right we have you know really kind of more of a contribution from the carbon tetrachloride, I know it looks a little bit different because of the axis lines um, compared to then the actual toluene. Give in mind, right, that these do have different vapor pressures. They do have, you know, different inherent values or physical properties of vapor pressure because of the different types of forces of attraction that exist in terms of strength. So this is just really a pictorial version of what we see in the top right hand corner, right? Where liquid A we could say is the toluene and liquid B we could say is the carbon tetrachloride. So let's look at uh, an example um, of this. So we are gonna look at the vapor pressure 
of a benzene uh, toluene uh, liquid liquid mixture. So we know that we're talking about two liquids here. Um, at 100 degrees Celsius is 760 millimeters of mercury. If the uh, pure vapor pressure of toluene is 557, millimeters of mercury at 100 degrees Celsius and for um, the pure and for the pure vapor pressure of benzene And that's 1344 millimeters of mercury. Calculate the mole fraction of benzene in the solution. So there's our question. We have this liquid-liquid mixture. Um, uh, we have basically a, a total vapor pressure. If we kind of read what's what's given here, right? The vapor pressure of the benzene toluene liquid-liquid mixture is 760 millimeters of mercury. So right there is our total vapor pressure of the you know of the solution. We then also have the pure vapor pressure here of our toluene as the 557. And we have the benzene at 1344 for its pure vapor pressure. So all of this, uh, as well as the idea of a liquid-liquid mixture Right, it's pointing to Raoult's law. Right, so we're just looking at that pressure total is equal to the mole fraction then of, let's say, our benzene times the pure vapor pressure of our benzene plus then the mole fraction of the toluene times the pure vapor pressure of the toluene. So that's the equation that we want to use and you know we have all the information so far in terms of pressure. We see a lot of temperatures given. Um, keep in mind temperature just means that these are all relatable. You know, so remember vapor pressure changes with temperature. So that's why it kind of keeps getting mentioned within the question. that the fact that they're all at the same temperature means that we can relate all these vapor pressures to one another. So if I start to substitute, you know, the values that, that I was given, right, I know my pressure for the toluene was the 557 millimeters of mercury and the pressure or the pure vapor pressure of my benzene was 1344 millimeters of mercury, right? 
Um, I can start off the process by just starting to plug in my, my values. I also know, remember, that the total pressure as, as well being 760 millimeters of mercury. So if I plug those in, then I should be able to solve for the mole fraction of benzene. What I think we'll find here is that we might have a small issue that we have to get past. So the small issue is the fact that we still have two unknowns. That I don't know my mole fraction of toluene because I need to know that to get to my mole fraction of benzene. Um, so how do I solve this particular type of expression? We want to remember some old algebra. And this is namely uh, solving one unknown in terms of another unknown. Right? This can be done if um, both unknowns uh, create the whole or the total. So if we go back up and think about our definition of mole fraction, right, our mole fractions are really, you know, mole percents, but we just haven't multiplied by 100. So just like mole percents or percents in general add up to 100 percent, um, the fractions of those percents add up to one. So the mole fraction of benzene plus the mole fraction of toluene is equal to one. And I can just rearrange that to solve for one unknown in terms of the other. So now I know what the mole fraction of toluene is, and I know what it is with respect to the benzene. And if I plug those back into the expression above, right, then that's where I can see that now I only have um, one unknown in the process. So if we start to plug our values in again, we have our 760 times our mole, I'm sorry, is equal to our mole fraction of benzene times our 1344. We're gonna add that then to our mole fraction of toluene. And our mole fraction of toluene is one minus the mole fraction of benzene times its pure vapor pressure of 557 millimeters of mercury. So we're taking this toluene, right, and we're substituting in for what it actually is equal to, which is one minus the benzene. So now we just need to do um, some derivation here uh, and really treat mole fraction uh, as an X. I'm just gonna leave units out for now, this makes it a little bit easier. So if we multiply through, we would have 557 minus uh, 557 times the mole fraction of our benzene. So they're just distributing through. So then I want to, you know, basically collect uh, like terms. I would have my 760 minus my 557. And then I would have my 1344 times X, or the mole fraction of benzene, minus 557X, or the mole fraction of benzene. So if we uh, combine those, right, we get a, a difference of 203 on the left, 
and we get a difference of 787 on the right and then we can solve for our mole fraction of benzene and we get a value of 0 0.258 so that's how you can use Raoult's law to determine mole fraction and just how Raoult's law works as far as this idea of vapor pressure and then contribution. Um, the mole fraction is really the contribution. The greater that number is, the greater um, it you know contributes to or contributes its vapor pressure to the total vapor pressure. So what we have to understand, though, is Raoult's law um, is a prediction. And it's um, a prediction based on the idea that the solution's forces of attraction are basically um, ideal or the same as the individual liquids forces of attraction. So we have to realize that first off, that this is a prediction. Um, so um, often the, you know, the actual observed vapor pressure is uh, different. than what is calculated by Raoult's these are non ideal solutions so we have Raoult's law was a prediction based on the idea that we have forces of attraction that are ideal, right, are the same, essentially. However, we do find often that the vapor pressure is different than what is calculated, and then these are non-ideal types of solutions. And so this kind of ascribes to the forces of attraction that are then present within the liquid-liquid um, solution. So if you're pressure uh, total for the solution in terms of you know Raoult's law is greater than the pressure total for the solution experimental right the actual experiment this basically means that the forces of attraction in the solution are uh, stronger than what is predicted by Raoult's. Remember that the idea of, you know, lower vapor pressure equals stronger force. So we can have that scenario where we have, you know, our vapor pressure observed by an experiment is actually lower than what we calculate from Raoult's, and so that just means that we have stronger forces of attraction 
than what is predicted. Um, but we could have the other scenario as well, where now the pressure that's calculated is actually less than what we observe uh, in an experiment. And so that's just the opposite now. This means that the forces of attraction are now actually weaker. So those are the two scenarios that you have. And, you know, you uh, we can always calculate it using Raoult's law. Um, we would have to be given the experimental vapor pressure, vapor pressure to compare the two. So, so we always have the ability to predict or calculate using Raoult's law. Um, then we would actually have to do an experiment or, you know, be given the actual, you know, observed or experimental vapor pressure to then make this um, relationship, um, you know, as far as whether we could say that, oh, things are stronger in solution as far as forces or things are weaker in solution in terms of forces, in terms of these liquid-liquid mixtures. And that is um, Raoult's Law, um, very specific to liquid solutes.